Hi, everybody. Hope you can all hear me just fine. And welcome to uh, tonight's uh, lesson. Uh, as I have been, you know, putting these lessons together, I've realized how literally how shallowly I'm dealing with all of these topics. And uh, it actually has made me um, uh, uh, really understand that I've got to do a whole lot more teaching on this area. So I'll be sending everybody who's enrolled in this uh, webinar series the link. Uh, December 19th, I'm going to do a preview for uh, a series of like about 26 webinars I'm going to do next year for free. Like same same way I did the uh, emotional healing online, uh, dealing with uh, a lot of these bigger principles that I really want to share with people. And so that will be kind of a preview for that. So please watch for that in your email. Um, Tonight, we're going to get into the mental world uh, uh, of our consciousness and uh, ha have some interesting things to share about this and talk about the energy centers in this thing. And for the person who asked about the energetic aromatherapy, yes, that uh, final class is this weekend. So I, I want to explain a little something about the, the spheres of the uh, tree of life, because obviously this whole... Um, uh, presentation is based on understanding these energies. And the tree of life, as I've been talking about it, is, is represented on the left um, as a series of spheres interconnected by various pathways. Um, oh, let me go ahead and uh, also put, uh, before I forget, uh, put up, I didn't get them posted on the web, but I've got a uh, set of handouts, so I'll put them up so you can download them right now if you want to uh, download them and follow along. Uh, I will get them put up um, on the page I have at Modern World Medicine where I'm putting the recordings for this as well as uh, a set of handouts for this. So uh, another way of representing this is as a series of uh, concentric spheres, circles within circles, or as, you know, the the idea of Ezekiel wheels within wheels. Um, so if if you think of it as basically e expanding layers of, of understanding, if you starting at the bottom, you're in the innermost sphere. And, and so think about that as the world of the child. It's, it's very contained. Uh, the child has very little comprehension and we grow through stages we, 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 we suddenly wake up and our, our consciousness expands and we get a bigger picture of the world. We get a bigger understanding and we expand through our egocentric self where we're absorbed in us into a world of relationships uh, where, where we become more aware of other people and other people's feelings and other people's needs and, and we're able to actually navigate and start working with people. And then... If you think about the biggest sphere, okay, of, of, of us is the sphere of the mind in which we're able to comprehend and think about things that we may need, maybe have never actually had direct physical experience with. Like most of us have some idea of like world geography, even though we've never traveled to those countries, we've heard of them, we know a little bit about them, we've seen maps, we, we have this bigger understanding. So our consciousness is basically expanding outward in an ever increasing ability to reach out beyond ourself into a, into a greater understanding. So that's another way of, of looking at this. And so as we talk about the, the world of the, the mind, this is, uh, uh, we're, we're talking about this idea of growing upward through the, the spheres at the bottom up to the sphere at the top, but this is also an outward expansion of our understanding and our consciousness in the world. And so um, the, um, the head world basically has within it, of course, this holographic idea of expansion, contraction, and uh, uh, equilibrium. And the, we have two sides of our brain, the, the right brain and the left brain. And because the, and th this is one of the things that was confusing and a little bit confusing and hard to teach is because the right brain controls the left side of the body and the left brain controls the right side of the body. When we talk about the right side of the body, it refers to the left brain. And when we talk about the left side of the body, it refers to the right brain. And so 
I label them as the right and left brain centers, but, uh, but they're picked up on the opposite side. In other words, the left brain center is picked up on the right side, the right brain center is picked up on the left side because uh, you have this crossover in the nervous system that the opposite side of the brain controls the other side of the body. Uh, and then we have this overarching idea of consciousness, um, which we're going to talk more about next week. Um, and so the, 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 there's a spiritual aspect to the right brain uh, because it deals with things like images and creativity and imagination and likeness and connection. Whereas the physical brain, the physical aspect of, of, uh, life all the way down the whole physical pillar of the tree and all the way down through the those energy centers on the um right side of the body um you're dealing with this idea of the physical separates okay it it it, it differentiates whereas the spiritual unites so the the physical side of our brain takes things apart it takes things apart and labels them and looks at the differences between one thing and another thing and basically analyzes and picks everything apart. That's the logical left brain, kind of the scientific mathematical side of our brain. And then the more artistic side of our brain puts things together. And uh, I was watching a little video and uh, uh, a psychologist was talking about, this is sort of a, a big picture idea of the two sides of our brain. Um, it's not you know, it, zero in and it's much more holographic than that. But it kind of gives you this idea that we have one side of our brain, he says, that deals with what we already understand, what we've been able to logically figure out and assimilate. But life is always presenting us things that are challenging things that we've not had to deal with before that are new. And so the, the right intuitive brain helps us navigate things that we don't understand, things that are new. Uh, and, and gives us the, the idea of future possibilities and so forth. So this is a little bit of kind of the difference between the two sides of our brain, the, the left brain being logical, the right brain being intuitive, the left brain being sequential, the right brain being more holistic, analytical versus creative, verbal versus visual, uh, in other words, language versus images, uh, the rational versus the imaginative, the practical versus the impetuous or spontaneous, the scientific versus the artistic, the mathematical versus the philosophical, the strategic uh, versus the possibility, the past versus the future, compartmentalized versus uh, uh, the uh, associative brain. So um, like I said, this is, this is rough because there's aspects of both sides in, of both of these things in both sides of the brain, but dominantly the one side deals with the one and the other side deals with the other. So we have the same division that, that we've seen in the heart world and in the physical world between the part that draws things together and the part that separates things. And it continues right up to the, to the level of the brain that you can see this uh, differentiation very, very clearly. So, uh, an easy way to think about this is that the left brain sees the trees and the right brain sees the forest. And the integration of the right and left brain, the ability to have the higher level of consciousness is to be able to simultaneously perceive the forest and the trees, to see the logical and the intuitive, the, the mathematical and the creative. In other words, to be able to have a high level of function in both aspects of our mind. And this is something that uh, very few people in our society develop. And one of the things that I believe is valuable about my trying to understand the tree of life and these energetic models that, that are subdivisions of the tree of life is they actually force you into developing this kind of, of brain because you're, you're seeing both parts and relationships. You're seeing, it, it literally trains your brain to see both sides of the thing and integrate them. And it's why I wanna do more teaching on this because just even though I know it's, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to master, it greatly expands your consciousness and your ability to comprehend things when you're able to equally train and develop both sides of your brain and uh, have this consciousness. So the left brain, this is very important to understand, the left brain is 
the part of our brain that primarily deals with language. Now, language is symbolic. And that sphere on the tree of life is understanding. And the Hebrew name for that sphere is bina, which literally means the space that separates two things. So in other words, that's the idea of differentiation, how two things are unalike. So that part of our brain, what it does is it, is it takes the world apart and assigns labels to the different parts. Now, now, if you really get into the sciences and you really get into, you know, the scholastic thing in a very deep way, you'll find that a heck of a lot of any field is mastering the vocabulary of that field. And one of the analogies I like to make of this is uh, before I studied botany, leaves were leaves. After I started studying body, uh, botany, leaves were simple and compound. Leaves were uh, pinnate and palmate. Leaves were uh, had entire margins and lobe margins and evate margins, and they had uh, different kinds of hairs. And they had different. There, there were all these words that I learned that described all these different parts and structures of leaves. That when you started learning that, you started to differentiate more clearly all these different leaves, things that you don't, you wouldn't normally see because you're seeing how, how the leaf of this plant is different than the leaf of that plant, which is really important when you're trying to learn to identify plants is to be able to see the differences and distinguish one thing from another. And that's a great deal of what um, we do in our, in our Western society. And that's really a lot what science does. It takes things apart trying to understand them. Um, and part of that is being able to give labels to things. Now, it's very important to understand that language is entirely symbolic. Um, the, and the, the words we use in language, basically there's two basic kinds of words. One is words that apply to concrete things that we see and observe. Like, you know, I, I take a, 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 a bottle you know, like like this, and I go, okay, that's a that's a, a bottle, or a, or it's an apple, or whatever we say, and and it's very easy for us on that level to understand the meaning of words. If we've all eaten an apple, we all know what the experience of eating an apple is like, and when we say apple, it refers back to a very common experience. But we also use words to label abstract or spiritual concepts like love and fear and duty and liberty and freedom and all kinds of things that we can't point to in the physical world. See, the, the difference between the concrete thing is that it's something that you can see, hear, touch, and smell. But we also have meaning, which, which in, involves seeing how things are interrelated in a way that, that it involves how they interact with each other. And that's the spiritual aspect of language, the abstract thing of language, where we find meaning. You know, love, what is love? Point to love, give me a physical description of love. We only see love existing because we observe the effects of love in the way people interact with each other. And the same thing with hate. We don't physically see, touch, taste, or smell those things. And, but, but and, and that's in that form of language, it becomes a little more difficult to communicate because my subjective experience of what that means and your subjective experience of what that means off, off times differ, okay? Now, what makes symbols dangerous is symbols can use be used to create lies or illusions. In other words, to, to, to say things that don't actually have reference to reality. So one of the problems with the with language is it's capable of deception. And, and we need to overcome our obsession with the left brain, the physical side of our mind, and learn to more greatly develop the spiritual side of our mind, the intuitive right brain side of our mind. Now, some people are better developed in their uh, intuitive right side of their mind, and they're very not developed in the left side, but that's the exception rather than the rule. Most people in our culture, 80 to 90% of people in our culture are overtrained 
in the left brain and undertrained in the right brain. It's a very rare person that switches that and is overly active in the right brain and not very active in the left brain. In which case, they're very imaginative, but they're not very practical. But coming back to the idea of language, okay, because they're symbols, words can become idols. That, that we can take words and we can make words more important than meaning. And, and what happens is that the idea that we can label something and we can come up with a word for it often makes us think that we understand it when we don't understand it. It, it allows our brain to just gloss over things and dismiss them. And I, my insight into this came one day when I was walking down the, the, the street because I was uh, on, I can't remember why I was walking on foot from one place to another. I, I maybe had parked someplace and was just taking a walk. And I was, my botany was kicking in and I was looking, ah, dandelion, Taraxacum officinale, you know, the, <laughs> these different plants. And when I said that, you know, in my brain, dandelion at Traxacum officinale, the, the spirit stopped and said, wait a, wait a minute, wait a minute. That plant that you just labeled and dismissed is unlike any other plant in the entire world. There is no other plant like it. And you just looked at it, labeled it, and did, you didn't even see it. And, and I realized, like, wow, we're doing that all the time. We're just labeling everything around us. And because we already have the label in our head for it, we never see it. We, we, we've, we've, become, we've become idolatrous in our thinking because we think that because we know a symbol that we think represents something, that, I mean, that's the same thing as actually understanding it or experiencing it. And, and we do this with people. We just, okay, that's a good person, that's a bad person, this guy's a jerk, that guy's nice, blah, 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 blah. And we don't even see the person because we've already created the label that pigeonholes them and categorizes them and shoves them in the little box that we create in our mind. And that becomes very, very dangerous. I studied communications in college and one of the most valuable things that I learned was one of my professors said, meanings are not in words meanings are in people in other words the the uh, the many many things that we have a subjective meaning of that's different from what other people do and so we often uh make a mistake of uh there's a passage in isaiah that says woe unto them that make a make a man an offender for a word in other words we take someone and because of the words they used we make them to be evil because and they may not have made anything harmful at all, okay? But we take offense at their words because those words are, you know, have a negative connotation to us when maybe they didn't have a negative connotation to them because they're, they're, what they were tr the meaning they were trying to convey maybe didn't come out in the words the way they wanted it to. But we like, you said this, you, but you said this, blah, 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 instead of trying to understand the meaning of what they were trying to say. And so uh, an example that I, that I use to explain this is, let's say that you grew up and you had a puppy dog that was your best friend and that you had that dog for years and you loved that dog and that dog loved you and you had all this wonderful, happy experiences with dogs. And so when, when you say the word dog, the mean we we understand the that the dog represents a certain animal but that that very objective word still has a subjective meaning and so that dog to you the word dog to you represents loyalty and love and all these good feelings now suppose someone else when they were like two or three years old got attacked by the neighbor dog got viciously bitten and so they, they, they had to go to the hospital. They had to have stitches. They were terrified. Uh, dogs now to them represent something scary, something terrifying, something that they, that they don't like, that makes them feel uncomfortable. And so this is why language has this subjective connotation to it. And to, to create understanding, you have to be willing to look past the words to try to understand 
what the other person means by the words they're using. And I think part of the reason I gravitate to this idea is because when I was young, I hated arguments. I hate, I still hate arguments. I still hate contention. I hate getting into a fight with anybody over anything. Uh, and it's hard sometimes because people, you know, are so quick to take offense because they're so wounded inside. And so you say something that you think is going to be innocent and try to help them. And, and, and they, it, it touches something painful inside of them, like the, the dog thing I just, I mentioned. And they react like, you know, you set out to hurt me, blah, 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 and, and they're defensive. And so because I hated it, I uh, starting in my teens, I, I used to watch people arguing. And I often figured out that they actually were not that much in disagreement. They were arguing over the words that they used to represent the same reality. And, and this I see happening a lot in religion. I see it happening a lot in politics. It, 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 there, you, words can be very twisting and manipulative because of this problem. So symbols become dangerous. They become idolatrous when they lose their connection to what they represent. And, the, and a prime example of this is money, okay? If, if you go back into originally what the word money comes from, the roots of the term money refer to coinage. So basically people considered gold and silver valuable. So they created coins and coins were a way of, of uh, placing a value on the amount of gold or silver that was present in the coin. So it'd be like you go to buy, you buy a pound of butter, you know that you're getting a certain amount of butter. And so the words that were used in money, like pound and dollar and these different words in cultures, all basically referred to a certain amount by weight and volume of precious metals. So a dollar uh, is, I guess, one twentieth of a troy ounce of 99.9% .9 pure silver, according to a law passed by Congress. So the word dollar is actually a word that's like pound. It has no meaning outside of reference to something else. So like um, if I said, I'm going to give you a pound or I'm going to give you a gallon, your question would be a gallon of what? A gallon of water, a gallon of oil, a gallon of whatever, a pound of butter, a pound of hamburger, a pound of vegetables, right? It has no meaning outside of, of, of what it is. But what happens happened is, is that um, banks started creating notes, IOUs, which you know used to say like a silver certificate will pay to the bearer on demand, $1 silver. In other words, it, it's like a receipt for a dollar's worth of silver. And you could go to the bank and say, I want my silver, all right? But as people got used to the idea of trading around the notes, they removed the value and just a dollar became what? Nothing, just nothing. In fact, what it says on the Federal Reserve bet is this note, and a note is a, 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 a note of indebtedness, meaning this debt, this note that says I owe something to somebody else is legal tender. In other words, my IOU, I trade my IOU to you for, for goods and services. It, it, it's all just gone crazy. This is some of the stuff I want to I want to talk about, you know, because it's it's insanity, but because people get so caught up in words and symbols, they they never think deeply enough to really understand what's going on, and part of this is learning to develop your whole brain, which is getting in touch with your creativity, which is the opposite of analyzing things. It's being able to see the connections between things, to be able to see how different ideas are interrelated, how different uh, the underlying connections between things. And it also enables you to see opportunities where other people see challenges. It, it gives you the ability to creatively navigate life. And it also is where wisdom is. That sphere on the tree of life refers to the idea of wisdom. It, it, it's the ability to take knowledge and apply it to new and changing situations and to see how one piece of information is connected to another piece of information and how that piece of information 
is connected to a greater whole rather than just an isolated piece of data. And uh, one of the things that, that people will often see about me in my teaching is I'll take and I'll give people a big picture understanding of things and then fill in data within that big picture. Whereas most of the time people are out giving you a whole bunch of data, but nothing that allows you to link it together into a cohesive whole in your mind. That was sort of the big things I tried to do with natural healing is to give people an overarching philosophy of healing rather than just take this for this problem, take that for this problem, take this for that problem. You no, know, why? What's going on that's beyond that? Now, in relation to this, I just want to make a, a comment about this passage of scripture that many of you know about, the, the word. You know, John uh, 1, 1 through 5 in the New Testament, the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word. Now, I found out um, a few years ago that that word that was translated as word in the Greek was logos. In the beginning was the logos, is what the Greek reads. And the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. Now, what is Logos? This is very important to understand. Logos is the meaning behind the words. Logos is the idea that is trying to be conveyed in words. So it isn't the actual words, which are, which are symbols of the idea. It is the the reality behind the symbols that is endeavoring to be conveyed. Now that really changes this because this, in other words, you could read this, in the beginning was the idea or the ideal or the meaning that dwelt with God and was in God and was God. And through that idea or that meaning that was held within God, everything was made. And in that Logos in that meaning was life and the light of men. And then Jesus was the embodiment of the meaning, of the intention, of the ideal, or how I mean, so you understand there's a depth to this that God had in mind when he created the universe. It, it, it really conveys a very interesting thing. And then there's this passage, the light shineth in the darkness and the darkness comprehendeth it not. In other words, people's minds are blinded so they can't perceive the meaning. They can't perceive the light. They can't perceive the truth. They, 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 they are closed and unable to comprehend the, 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 the meaning or the intention, or the whatever the, of God, and you can see that you can call, you can ponder that and think deeply about that, and it gets you know deeper into your system. It's not just words; it's trying to convey something that's very, very deep and very profound and very spiritual. And this is true of many, many things that people superficially worship the literal words rather than pondering and praying and meditating and getting into what do the words mean? What is the meaning that is being done here? Now, this, this is an idea that I learned many, many years ago from the parable of the sower. And it's the idea that the parable of the sower uh, represents four ways we can deal with a new idea, with, a, with, a, with that logos, with that meaning. You can see, because when I give you an idea, which I like I'm giving you in this thing. It's a seed. The words that I am saying are a symbolic representation, a micro piece of the possibility of what I'm trying to communicate. And just because you've heard the words doesn't mean you've understood the meaning. In order to understand the meaning, you have to plant the idea in your soul and let it grow so that it will grow into an understanding of the fullness of the meaning of the idea so that the the seed grows into the fullness of the plant now if people are completely closed minded okay that's you you throw out the seeds the ideas and they land on this dry barren ground that won't let the seed in and then 
she says the birds come and eat the seeds, which is representative of Satan coming and just plucking the words so that so it never never has any even chance to take root in people's mind because their minds are blocked, hardened, closed. They they're not they already know everything. I know, I've already decided I know what's true and blah, 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 blah. And so I have a sealed mind and I won't even receive it. Now an other person will go, Wow, what a cool idea. That's nice. And then they forget about it. So the the seed goes into the ground, it sprouts up just a little bit, and then the sun just blows it away because there's not enough soil, not enough ability to c cultivate an idea within them because they can just go, oh, well, okay, and then go on to the next idea. They never have the ability for those ideas to take root. Now, there's a third possibility of what can happen with that idea, that word, that seed, that logos that meaning that tries to be conveyed to someone and someone accepts it they think wow that's great and they start to apply it and then the weeds come up and all the all the cares of the world and they run into some obstacles and it's harder to do than they thought it was going to be and so forth and so the it it gets choked out okay and then there's the person who takes the idea and and recognizes it's growing and it's good and they nurture it and they pluck out the weeds and what happens is it grows up to a fullness inside of them and they become the embodiment of that idea that idea grows up until it is a part of them and when it's a part of them they become a light for that idea and they bear fruit they bear results they bear the seed that then transmits to try to to uh, reform other people's ideas, and uh, and uh, this that by the way relates to uh, this whole way of learning that I learned that I, I I need to talk about in in next year's webinars. Now I really like this little story from Conversations with the Masters by Anthony DeMello. Uh, and, and these are just a series of stories he wrote about a fictitious spiritual master. Um, and they're designed to convey an idea, okay? Because stories are a nice way to convey an idea. And he says, once the master spoke on the hypnotic power of words, someone in the back room shouted, you're talking nonsense. If I say God, 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 will that make me divine? And if I say sin, 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 will it make me evil? So the master says, sit down, you bastard. And the man just, uh, in the story, the man is stunned for a minute and then all of a sudden he finds his voice and he bursts out in a livid and basically you know attacks back and blah 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 and then the master looks contrite and says i'm sorry i i I, let, I got carried away i apologize for my unpardonable lapse and the man calms down and then he says this well there you have your answer all it took was a, a word to give you a fit and another to sedate you in other words we get so hung up on words that we literally can let words provoke us to anger, to fear, to jealousy, to hatred, to whatever, blah, 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 over just words, which are nothing more than symbols, idols. And so we, it, 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 we have to learn to see beyond that. In fact, the reality of the, the thing of turning the other cheek um, in, in the Aramaic culture, where out of which Bible says to smite someone on the cheek means to insult them, to say, you know, you're stupid, you're blah, 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 blah. And Jesus said, when someone insults you, just turn the other cheek. What does it mean? Who, what do you have? Of, what, are you, what are you defending? I mean, it's, it's not like, okay, if someone's trying to kill you, yeah, defend yourself. If someone's trying to steal from you, defend yourself. But if someone's just insulting you, it, it's only your ego. You're this, this thing of you that values all of your symbols and blah, 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 that's offended. Nothing really has harmed you. Just turn the other cheek and move on, okay? Now, I'm not going to get into the whole idea of nonviolent communication, but I, I, I think this is a really, really uh, valuable thing. If you've never read uh, the book Nonviolent Communication, it talks about how to navigate through all this in a very, very practical way. Um, you can find out, there's actually a whole bunch of books in, from nonviolent communication, and the website is up there. But basically what it has to do is that when you, you make a statement 
and you observe facts and it explains the difference between facts and perceptions because most of the time we don't tell the facts we we give our interpretation of the facts um and then state your feeling about the fact and then state you know what's going on inside of you behind that feeling and the need that that represents and request to have that fulfilled so uh, an, an example of that which is a real story i read in a book about persuasion um a, a wife uh opened the credit card statement and saw a bill for a motel in town okay and she thought what is this and it alarmed her because her friend had found out that her husband was having an affair uh, because there were mo bills for a motel on the credit card statement. So she could have, if she was, you know, allowed herself to, she could work herself all up into, you know, my husband's having an affair, blah, blah, blah. And the first thing, you know, meet him at the door, you know, accuse him of having an affair, blah, 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 or whatever. But when you do nonviolent communication, you and this is actually what the lady did, even though it, it, it wasn't based on nonviolent communication. She said, honey, I saw this bill for a motel on the credit card statement. I became very afraid because a friend of mine found that her husband um, was having an affair because of this. And I, I and I need to know if you're actually loyal for me because I, I'm I'm very scared about this. You know, I, I I don't I don't want to be betrayed or hurt. And and because she approached it that way, her husband said, "Well, I don't know what that is either." And so they called and they found out that they had gone out on a date to a restaurant together that was attached to that hotel. And the hotel showed up on the bill. So that was actually a date between the two of them. And it could have blown into this huge, horrible argument or whatever, but because you you stick with the facts and whatever, that's nonviolent communication. And that's something that's very difficult for most of us to master. And it's very difficult also for us to master the difference between asking and demanding. Because most of us, we never ask, we demand. We feel we're entitled to what we want. We feel other people are obligated to to, to treat us the way we think they ought to. And therefore, going back to what we talked about last time, we live on this level of judgment and we reward and punish people depending on whether they please us or don't please us. And feel like, you know, that especially if you're in the self-centered thing, you don't care if you win and they lose because you just wanna win. Asking implies the idea that I'm vulnerable enough to ask and know that that person doesn't have to fulfill my request, okay? They have a right to say no, and I don't have a right to punish them or, or mistreat them because they tell me no, because my job is to try to make a win-win. So when I'm playing my re request, I have to help them understand how it's in their benefit, not just mine. And that's the difference. And that's basically what you're doing when you're trying to persuade people rather than be able to um, trying to manipulate them is you, you have to start by honoring and respecting the other person that you don't want to force them to say yes unless they voluntarily agree to. And you have to understand that, that they're seeing life from a different perspective from you. So you have to get inside their head and understand where they're coming from and try to talk to them in their language and understand how you can communicate words that, that don't, and this is tricky, okay? And it also involves being able to communicate feeling without blaming other people for feelings. Uh, one of the authors I read, Stephen K. Scott, says that, that there are two parts to persuasive communication. One is to help the person understand what you understand. And the second is to help them feel what you feel, help them understand your feelings. And then if, if they understand what, what you're trying to say and they can feel what you're feeling, it, usually if you ask them, they'll be willing to make the change. And he, he has a whole uh, thing in, in, one of, in some of his books, Stephen K. Scott, about how to do that. So understand the difference between manipulation is you're trying to get someone else to do what you want, whether it's in their interest or not. Whereas persuading is someone trying, guiding someone with information and understanding to help them make a good choice that's gonna be in their best interest. 
Now, if, if you're married, it's in their interest to make sure that, that you are happy as well as they're happy to have a good relationship. Because if one of you is losing so the other one can win, the relationship is doomed to go into lose-lose. And, and, and that, that deals with you know elevating your consciousness, like I said last time, from, from the, the lower level of judgment into the level of justice and negotiation. And you have to look at, you know, when you're communicating, are you trying to manipulate others or are you trying to persuade others? You know, which is trying to explain to them why it's in their best interest to do something. Now that takes us into the energy centers we want to talk about in this lesson. The throat energy center, which is over the, the neck, um, right here, okay, is where we have both our thyroid and our voice box and the the neck connects the head to the chest in other words it connects the mental facility to the feeling spiritual facility and it orients us in the sense of communi communicating and knowing uh and the the name of that sphere in hebrew is dot and it's used in the bible as adam dot his wife eve and she conceived and they had a child so when i say that to people it's translated as adam knew his wife eve and she conceived well i would say that da'at da'at is a little more than a intellectual knowing it's a knowing that involves you know a, a personal relationship with with someone um the throat energy is damaged when we feel like we can't express ourselves when we don't have a voice when uh when other people are not going to care what we think or what we feel and it also can have be a difficulty within ourselves of connecting our thoughts and our feelings together so we're being split we're we're basically avoiding our feelings and living only in the word of the the world of the words of our head but we're not making the connection of the reality of our heart with the language of our head and remember that the right brain is also the feeling brain. And so if you have, if you're dominantly left brain and you don't have connection with your right brain, it can affect the thyroid energy and make it difficult for you to, to vocalize your feelings. Also, if you're a perpetual liar, and especially if you lie to yourself, if, you, if you're not being genuine or integrous inside of yourself, that can also affect your throat and it will disconnect you from the, your head from the reality of your body. All schizophrenics have a problem at the throat energy center, at the neck. They're, they're disconnected between the reality of their body and their emotions and the world of their head. And it's integrating those two that helps them basically become sane. If, if if you're disconnected that way, you're not sane, okay? Now, that can lead to physical problems with the thyroid, which are very, very common with the, community, with the, uh, the throat energy center not being uh, whole. It can also, you know, in the case of feeling stifled in your speech temporarily, lead to all kinds of throat problems like laryngitis and sore throats and so forth, or a stiff neck or difficulty swallowing or any other problems with the neck and the throat. And I've seen this very commonly, like with laryngitis, someone is feeling stifled in their communication. In fact, in rayet iridology, the thyroid center, the thyroid center is the center for blocked communication. So again, split personalities, schizophrenia, this dis detachment from reality, or being unable to speak up or soft-spoken or not being able to make my voice uh, heard, or be honest with myself and other people about what's really going on inside of me. These are all throat energy issues. Now understand that, that this is a higher level of problem that typically is an adult level problem, not a child level problem. Children don't normally have, you know, when they're little, problems with their throat energy because they say what they think and they say what they feel and whatever. You have to, again, be stifled and stifled and stifled and stifled many, many times before you give up on that. Okay. But little children are naturally very integrous in, inside of themselves. 
So the throat energy affirmations are here again, and they were again in module three. We covered uh, those quite a lot. We also covered the uh, essential oils that can be helpful for the throat. And we again covered flower essences that can be helpful for the throat. All of these are found on the charts that we developed for uh, aromatherapy uh, for emotional healing and the flower essences and affirmations for emotional healing. Uh, and again, they're also were covered in detail on, in module three. So you can go back and look at any of the things in module three to, to go over these again. This is just a review of uh, some of these uh, things that can be helpful for people who have these problems. Now we go up into the right brain, a uh, right temple, which is the left brain. And so this is, okay, so we started down on that, that, that side of the body, that right side of the body, which is the masculine side of the body that is also the physical side of the body that pushes away. And we start off with the liver, which is detoxification center, anger, pushing away what hurts us, being able to defend ourselves physically. And then we elevated that into the chest area with the thymus, which is our sense of self-esteem, self-worth, the ability to emotionally stand up for ourselves, the ability to basically create some order and, and stability in our lives. And then we elevate that idea from a social level, so from a physical level to a social, spiritual level, to a mental level. The left brain represents the idea to, to logically sort out what makes sense and what doesn't make sense to be able to uh, creatively assemble ideas, engineering, design. Uh, it's also the, the side of our brain that allows us to hold on to things like affirmations and have faith and optimism about uh, the future and so forth. So uh, it, it basically allows us to, to reject things that, that won't work and figure out what will work, okay? Again, separate and divide. And of course, that old idea of separating and labeling things. So positive left brain energy relates to the function of, of the uh, uh, left brain and pituitary gland, the language, math, logic, reason, classification, organization, creating goals and plans, prioritizing our life, having objectives, being able to move forward, uh, you know, go after what we want, reject what we don't want on a mental plane, basically carrying that whole thing downside. So uh, uh, both the left and the right brain, one of the things that could damage them is public school. Because being punished, being given bad grades, okay, because you didn't do well in art or you didn't do well in math or you didn't do well in whatever can cause you to internalize the idea, I can't do math, I'm no good at reading, I, I have no artistic ability and whatever. And once you internalize that idea, you basically damned yourself. You've stifled your ability to ever be good at math, to ever be good at reading, to ever be good at art, to be, ever be good at dance, because you basically have internally judged yourself because of that human humiliation or feeling like I'm not as good as other people and feeling stupid. Okay. So um, any kinds of those things will put, you know, issues that uh, make you so that you're not totally able to use your left brain to your best advantage. The left brain affirmations have to do with the idea. I'm intelligent. I can figure things out. I, I like science. I like math. I like, I, I'm capable of being logical and reasonable. I'm capable of using language, reading, writing, thinking clearly, etc. cetera. Um, that's what all those left brain affirmations are about. And of course you turn them into, you know, if, if a person I, doesn't believe that you turn it into the question and you'll go through the process of healing. These are all oils that help to activate that side of our brain producing mental clarity, helping us learn things better, uh, and so forth. And we also have, of course, the, the flower essences that help that side of our brain, uh, creating mental alertness, creating focus, creating the, the ability to learn from experience, to, to set goals, all of these kinds of things that are associated with the left brain. The right brain, which is on the left side of the body, 
is again where we have this intuitive creative side of our brain that allows us to see the big picture it allows us to see interconnections and relationships that allows us to piece the world back together it's one thing to be able any any child can take something like a watch apart but it takes wisdom to put it back together to see how all the pieces fit back into the whole anybody can disassemble something but to understand how all the parts work together to create a whole is what this side of our brain is all about and if if we if all we have is random facts and we have no ability to to integrate or synthesize them into a bigger picture a bigger whole then we're lacking in right brain ability and uh which allows us to 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 see the, the to see the forest to see the bigger picture and so forth this is related to the hypothalamus and limbic system in in the right brain and it allows us to see associations and connections it's also where we have athletic ability dance ability artistic ability and a more spiritual aspect of our mind it also helps us with relationships and navigating emotional issues um so again if if you're if you don't have the training if 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 our public education system has done away with most of the training in the humanities we 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 don't have as much emphasis being placed on physical education you know uh which is developing the body which helps develop the right brain uh, art dance music uh uh literature and i don't mean you know just reading literature but being able to discuss literature and kind of understand the meaning behind you know what a story or a poem is trying to to help us understand and so we're humiliated on that or we're made to feel unawkward or we are very practical minded and we don't believe in that there is any kind of a spiritual reality to things we can be very left brain and our right brain is very underdeveloped which, uh, which is, like I say, much more common in our society than the other way around. So the affirmations have to do with wisdom, creativity, artistic, being open to new ideas, enjoying uh, art, literature, and music. Um, and then uh, these are essences that open up this more creative side of our brain. Some of these that are on both lists actually help integrate the two sides of our brain, like peppermint, um, Will help that um and then you all uh also have the flower essences which have to do with again uh overcoming an overly left brain materialist view of the world and uh, getting in touch with our wisdom our creativity our ability to see a bigger picture in life all of which is um very helpful so um you end the slide presentation here come back to full screen so um what we're uh we're dealing with is is this idea of understanding our own mind our own intelligence now when we come into next week we'll talk about the two upper centers which the the center here which it was often called the third eye the thigh, the eye of perception is is what integrates our entire mental being it's also where we have inspiration inspiration is beyond our own thought processes beyond our own rationality and, and our own creativity it is information that's coming to us from a higher source all inventions all creativity all human progress comes from there we it, it, it comes because someone op opens their mind to perceive something that was never before perceived by anyone else and then it goes down through a process of creativity so uh that the the personal development goes up but creativity comes from the top down. It's stuff that gets downloaded in our brain and then we work it down from our mind into our heart and down into the physical world. And we're gonna talk about that next week, um, which uh, the, the next week is gonna be a very, it's a very interesting discu discussion. It's like the discussion last week. It's kind of a you know very important, 
very deep ideas, but if you can grasp them, it really changes the way you see um, everything. And uh, thank you for the comment. It's starting to make sense, but you have to adjust it. This is not stuff that you understand by just listening to. And, and that's why I talked about the whole idea of the, the parable of the sower. These ideas have to be planted in you and you have to think about them and start looking at ways to apply them. And they start to grow inside of you and your understanding expands. And basically you, it literally forces your brain to develop in ways that it hasn't been trained in. You see, in, in the educational model that we've grown up with, um, in my experimental class in learning and teaching, we, we called it the swallow and regurgitate method. You, you, in, you swallow what the teacher tells you and you regurgitate it back in the same form, which is just rote memorization. And rote memorization is not true learning. In order to, have true, in, in order to get the, the benefit of nutrition, you get the food, you take it into your body, you take it apart, you, you, you absorb it into you, then you reassemble it and make it into you. Well, it's the same thing with ideas. You get the idea, not you don't just memorize the words, you try to capture the idea behind the words. That idea behind the words is a seed. You put it in there, you think about it, you ponder it, you experiment with it. Maybe you, maybe you're, you go read a little bit more about it, do some, some, interesting things and then you know you it grows inside of you and then it's you start to actually understand it because it starts to become real inside of you and as you nurture it as it becomes real inside of you 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 grow up into a fullness of understanding that allows you now to share it with other people so the the model i learned was capture expand and share which is exactly the idea of the parable of sower you capture the seed you let it grow inside of you and then it creates seeds that you could share with other people now if you want to understand that from a spiritual perspective what what i want you to understand is a lot of people think that they understand spiritual things because they've memorized a bunch of passages from the bible and they know the words all right but they've never let the meaning of those words fully seek into, sink into their heart and pondered them and prayed about them and meditated on them until those ideas are growing up and changing their behavior and alternating their understanding of the world and allowing them to come into a relationship with God and receive wisdom and light and further understanding from him. And then as that grows up inside of you, it bears fruit. It bears the, the, the fruit of that spiritual awakening because now you become patient, you become kind, you become uh, charitable, you become loving, you become uh, peaceful inside. You have all this change inside of your soul that happens because you didn't just memorize and regurgitate a bunch of scriptures, right? That's basically what, you know, uh, the scripture, Pharisees, the scribes and Pharisees did, you know, they, they memorized all these scriptures and they knew all this stuff, but here is the living embodiment of what that was trying to point to standing in front of them and they reject it because their brains are closed because they already know all the answers. And that's, that's why I realized it's, it's really important for me to try to communicate all this because I, I, I feel like this is so missing in our society. It's missing in every aspect of our society. People are, are no longer able to really think and meditate and pray and let something really inside of themselves because you, you have to digest this information. It's not something you, that you're going to get by swallowing it okay, and just trying to memorize what I said. You could have to think about it and let the meaning of it, the logos of it, everything in life. What, what happened to me was everything, how I view politics, how I view education, how I view religion, how I view everything started to completely transform because everything became holographic. All truth became interrelated. All truth started to follow the same patterns, All whether it's scientific truth or, or spiritual truth, it all when I see it, it all integrates into one big whole. It's holographic. It's interconnected. It's not like science is over here, religion is over here, in my mind. 
they're like this. Everything becomes like this. It all, and as I read in this one thing, which relates to this idea of what we're going to talk about next next week with Kether, it that since God is one, God is wholeness, God is complete, total, unified perfection, all division and conflict we have, whether it's on a physical level or an emotional level or a mental level, is a representation of something that where we're disconnected from the oneness that's God. And as soon as we find the answer that takes the polarity, the, the parent polarity in our brains, and we have this aha moment that goes, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I see how, that, how there's a higher truth that transcends that apparent duality and connects the whole thing together. I've taken one step closer to God. I've taken one step closer to oneness. I am healing. I am becoming more whole and less divided and conflicted. And that's true whether we start on our the physical body, whether we go into our social area, or whether we're even talking about the world of ideas. Okay? So let me just uh, look and see if there's any specific questions here. Um, yeah. Um, you have answered a lot of questions I've asked you about my husband not being able to say what he is thinking. Okay, great. That's good. Uh, good, 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 good. Okay, I'm glad that, that that's been helping you. Uh, and I'm glad someone felt that I was explaining this because obviously this is not the easiest material in the world to explain, you know? Um, and sometimes people are a little bit scared of it because of that. But I but I guarantee that the... the uh, the more you delve into this, the more it all just starts to come together. And you really, really see what I'm talking about, how, how all things integrate. What is amazing to me about the Tree of Life, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more, not next week, but, but in the January when I do the last couple of lessons, is how the principles of the Tree of Life apply to science, mathematics, chemistry, all these things on a, on a physical level purely physical scientific level. And then it also applies to all these spiritual concepts, okay? All these things like um, things from the Bible, things that, you know, and you go like, wow, uh, an understanding of truth that, you, that it unites things that are apparently are divisive and brings them together, that's an amazing thing to do. Now, I, I'm going to be sending out an email to everybody about the webinar I'm doing on the 19th, where I'm going to talk, talk about this very idea. So I hope that some of you will participate in that as well. Um, so uh, some, someone mentioned if a 10 to 12 year old deals a lot with strep throat, living in a dysfunctional environment could be that. that's why they have physical elements in the throat and later thyroid. Yes, absolutely. What I'm saying is, what I'm trying to communicate to people is that besides the physical things that we think of that cause disease, there's a mental, emotional, spiritual component to all illness. And when you start to understand these various energies in the body, you start to be able to comprehend and understand some of the underlying things that may be taking place with this person beyond the idea that there's a bacterial infection. Why is their throat weak? Why do they always have this susceptibility? It's often because they feel unable to speak up for themselves. They feel unable to, to speak their truth. They feel unable to integrate what they're thinking with what they're feeling. And by helping them heal on that level, it also changes the physical level at the same time. That's one of the most important things I'm trying to communicate in this in entire course. So thank you for bringing that up. Well, I've reached the end of my time. Uh, thank you for uh, tuning in. Um, and I look forward to sharing more of this with you uh, next week. I appreciate all of you who have been uh, a part of this. Um, the oils you either inhale or you actually can uh, massage them into uh, in many cases, the, like the throat area or wherever that energy center is, you can actually put the oil uh, on that energy center as well as inhaling it. Okay, everybody. Thanks and good night.